These extraordinary stones come to us from a remote ancient time. The people who moved, stacked and carved them left a long time ago. Today, we stand in front of them with hundreds and thousands of thoughts and feelings. One day, we will eventually perish, but these stones will last forever because they've been made immortal. One day, 700 years ago, during the Yuan Dynasty, the people of Angkor met some envoys from China at Tonle Sap Lake. Among these envoys from China, there was one named Zhou Da Guan. He was from Yongzha in Wenzhou, Zhejiang province. On the 24th of March, 1295, Zhou Da Guan, an attaché of a Chinese diplomatic delegation, started the journey from Wenzhou, Zhejiang riding the trade winds to the estuary of the Mekong River. Then they went against the current and arrived at Angkor, located on the bank of Tonglai Sat Lake. At that time, Cambodia was known as Khmer. The views of Angkor were apparently beyond the wildest imagination of the delegation, who were shocked by this surreal world. Zhou Da Guan and the delegation stayed in Angkor, the capital city of Khmer, for a year. Later on, Zhou wrote the customs of Khmer, the first record of Angkor written by someone from the outside world. People consider the four miracles of ancient Eastern civilization to be the pyramids of Egypt, Borobudur in Indonesia, Angkor in Cambodia, and the Great Wall of China. From the 9th to the 15th century, Angkor was the capital city of Cambodia. Building of the Angkor construction complex started in 802 and lasted for 400 years. The total construction area reached nearly 300 square kilometers and 910 buildings have been preserved to this day. 25 Khmer kings participated in the great construction project in Angkor. Historians divide Angkor's construction history into the first, second and third Angkor. The Lansang Mekong River flows more than 4,000 kilometers southward from the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. It then slows down gradually in the middle of Cambodia, leaving sediment that has become the area's best soil and creating what has been Asia's most prosperous farmland for the last thousand years. 
Ancient Eastern civilization started from here, and Angkor Wat is not the only temple in this place. In the vast area from the source of the river to the sea, there are temples and altars almost everywhere. It's a place where human beings coexist in harmony with gods and goddesses. After 700 years, the Angkor we see today is the same as Jodagwan's description in many aspects. In the city wall, which extends about 10 kilometers around the city, there are five entrances. Each entrance has two layers of doors. There are two entrances facing the east and one facing each of the other three directions. The five entrances look similar to each other with a big moat outside the city wall and bridges beyond the moat. There are 54 stone gods on both sides of the bridge. The railings of the bridge are made of stone and carved in the shape of a snake. All the stone gods pull the snake with their hands. To walk among the ancient relics in Angkor is like walking through a gigantic scene in a nightmare. The historic relics in Angkor show a surreal imagination, including extraordinary, exquisite craftwork. The mixture of geometric structures is carefully designed with glory and fantasy, exaggeration and detail. Here, romanticism integrates perfectly with ordinary life. In 1112, Suryavarman II, the King of the Sun, became the new ruler of the ancient Khmer Empire. According to legend, he had the same character as the sun. He could make lotus flowers blossom and everything become prosperous. During the reign of Suryavaram II, Cambodia became the most prosperous country in Southeast Asia, and Angkor also entered the most glorious stage in its architectural history. Angkor Wat was built during this period. Of all the buildings in this city, Angkor Wat is the most famous. It was constructed during the second Angkor period. Angkor Wat is a temple dedicated to Vishnu. Since Suryavarman II believed in Vishnu, the guardian god of Hinduism, he ordered the construction of Angkor Wat for Vishnu. Vishnu is the leading god controlling the order of the universe in Hinduism. According to legend, Vishnu falls into a sleep while lying on Ananta the big snake and floats in the sea of the universe. This one sleep equals one cycle of the universe or 4.3 billion human years. After Vishnu wakes up, a lotus flower will grow from his navel. Then Brahma, who is born from the flower, will start to create the world. At the end of the cycle, Shiva, the god of destruction and reproduction, will destroy the world. Vishnu will alternately sleep and wake, and the universe will be created and destroyed on a continuous basis. Angkor Wat was built by stacking up big stones on a plane. There are 1,532 stone columns, and over 3 billion tons of stones were used. Most of the stones weigh 500 kilos each, the biggest one 10 tons. The handmade work is carefully designed and accurately built. No adhesive material was used during the entire process, but the stones are connected so closely that the error of height at the highest level between the north and south walls is less than 0.1%. All people coming here want to climb to the top of Angkor Wat, but this is extremely difficult. 
It is said that Angkor Wat is a gigantic symbol. According to the Hindu philosophy, the center of the entire world is a high mountain known as Kailash, located in the middle of the sea. All the gods and goddesses live here, and it is surrounded by four small mountains. Both the sun and moon encircle the middle of the mountain, and a vast sea lies at the foot of it. Cambodian people use abstract geometric forms to show this imaginary pattern of the universe and constructed this building accordingly. Angkor Wat, the largest religious building in the world, took 89 years to complete. A total of 150 million people participated in the project. When it was finally constructed, great Suryavaram II had long passed away. The entire building of Angkor Wat can be divided into three levels, representing the underworld, the human world, and heaven. The first level is a winding corridor with exquisite basso relievo. It surrounds sacrificial altars in the middle of the building. The height difference between these altars is 10 meters, and the highest altar is 65 meters from the ground. This is the top of the altar. There are five stone pagodas here, with the middle one standing the highest. This is the center of heaven. The concepts of the underworld, the human world, and heaven are not only represented in the architectural form, but also in the more vivid basso relievo on the walls along the winding corridor of the first level. On this long relief wall, is a scroll revealing the spiritual world of the Khmer people. On the wall in the east winding corridor is the story of the churning of the Sea of Milk. According to legend, there was a longevity elixir buried under the Sea of Milk at the foot of Kailash Mountain, guarded by a python. In order to get the elixir, God and the devil pulled the two ends of the python, thus churning the Sea of Milk. The water in the sea began to boil, and all the creatures in it died. Kailash Mountain was about to rotate and collapse. Thereupon, Vishnu transformed into a gigantic tortoise to support the mountain. A thousand years later, all kinds of precious gems were churned up from the bottom of the sea, including the elixir. Lakshmi, Vishnu's future wife, was also born from bubbles in the seawater. On four walls of the winding corridor are engraved all kinds of legends and stories from Hindu mythology. On the north wall are the stories of Vishnu fighting with the Sky Devil. One half of the west wall has stories from the Hindu epic Ramayana, while the other half depicts stories of the Mahabharata. On the south wall are scenes of the ancient Khmer fighting with invaders. The Mekong River Delta area has always been a place envied by all. Since the land is prosperous and enjoys convenient transportation via its dense water network, the one who controls it will surely possess wealth and power. Under the forest. Walking along the stone wall, one can see that the engraving techniques of the Khmer constantly matured and improved. Each wall is 778.28 meters long, and it takes two to three hours to see them all by walking. These stones in Angkor want to tell us of a brilliant and splendid civilization. All the storylines become eternal here, continuing on forever.
Another long wall with reliefs surrounds the Bayon Temple. The themes of these reliefs mainly center on ancient life in Cambodia. People go to market, do business, hunt, and cook the animals they catch. They treat diseases, give birth, entertain, and play music. They wrestle, dance, play, fight, and build houses. There are about 11,000 people on the wall. Looking closely at the gigantic picture and examining the description of Zhou Da Guan, the picture of ancient Angkor gradually becomes clear. According to observations made by Zhou Da Guan, the houses for the king, officials, and ordinary people were wood tile structures or mainly simple thatched cottages. Although the king wore silver and gold jewelry, he was barefoot just like other people. As for ordinary people, there was no table, chair, bowl, or bucket in their house. They cooked with an earthen kettle and drank soup directly from coconut shells or tree leaves. They ate with their hands and slept on mats laid on the ground. That's the way the ancient Khmer lived and built Angkor. Several centuries have passed. All these people have gone. Only these altars and temples made of stone remain. Modern archaeological excavation has failed to find any trace of human settlement in this area. Few everyday utensils have been excavated, and some Westerners even doubted that the historic relics in Angkor were created by Cambodian people. But they are wrong. All the scientific evidence obtained on a continuous basis shows that those who built Great Angkor are the ancestors of the Cambodian people. George Curtis from the Department of Cambodia at the French Institute of Far East Studies spent several years comparing the faces of modern Cambodian people with the faces carved on the stones in Angkor. He finally concluded there are physiological similarities between them. 25 kilometers northeast of Angkor Thom is Bonte Shri, the Queen Palace, famous for exquisite carvings. It was built in 967 at the order of Jayavarman V, the King of Angkor. But the palace was not built for a queen. Since there are many goddesses carved into the building, local people call it the Queen Palace. The temple is actually dedicated to Shiva, the god of creation and destruction. Built during the second Angkor period, it was profoundly affected by the architectural style of Hindu temples. In 889, the building of Angkor Thom started at the order of Yasovarman I. Succeeding kings ordered a large amount of construction projects in the city. Two centuries later, when Suryavarman II wanted to build Angkor Wat, there was no space for it in the city of Angkor Thom and he had to move it outside the city. Currently, as with most buildings, the only things that remain are the foundation and smashed stones. But a lot of temples managed to survive, among which the most famous one is the Bayon Temple located in the downtown area. In the Khmer language, the word Tom means big, during the reign of Jayavarman VII, Angkor Thom was already a big city with one million residents. Take a walk among the piles of stones. Find something and experience it. The neatly arranged buildings are works of architecture while the smashed and scattered parts are known as ruins. There is only one form of time prevailing here, namely eternity.
Jayavarman VII was another great king of the Khmer Kingdom. During his reign of over 40 years, the country had once again become the strongest empire in Southeast Asia. He believed in Mahayana, enlarged the area of the old Angkor Thom city, and ordered the construction of many monumental temples. The world-famous Khmer Smile. All the four Buddhist spiritual states, compassion, sorrow, happiness, and calm, appear on a single face. When you're in Bayon Temple, it seems that you've arrived in a maze of mirrors reflecting gigantic heads. These big head sculptures carved out of rock get close to each other like blossoming lotus flowers. They smile at each other as if they're looking at their own reflections in mirrors. They face and are intoxicated by their reflections, regarding at the same time the tiny people beneath them. The foundation of Bayan Temple is a square whose four sides are each 80 meters long. The main pagoda located in the center reaches about 43 meters above the ground. The temple is composed of 54 big pagodas of different heights. On top of each pagoda, there are four stone statues on four sides, totaling 216 statues. These gigantic sculptures are supposed to be Avalokitesvara, though most people imagine his face to be that of Jayavarman VII. The faces of gods smile on these rocks. They're dim and gloomy, not at all clear, despite the bright moonlight shed on them. After joyfully creating this divine miracle, the craftsmen became anonymous forever. Every day in the temple, the sun will shine on the top of the pagoda first. The mixed sounds of chirping birds and chanting monks have become a distinctive feature of the early morning hours in the area along the Lansang Mekong River. Rujinza 
，女神们梳着不同的发饰，据说有三十六种。塔普伦寺是奢耶跋摩七世国王为他母亲所修建的神庙。这处神庙看起来就像一个神灵与大自然进行惊心动魄的搏斗的现场。周身散发着银子般光芒的蛇树卡波克为首，丛林、藤蔓、苔藓、暴风雨、闪电、猛兽、炎热的阳光，以及黑夜，在几百年中疯狂地扑向神庙。蛇树的根茎攀上梁柱，探入石缝，绑起门窗，压住屋檐，甚至从神庙的心脏上长出来，将神庙四分五裂。裹挟吞噬，但较量的结果是神庙与大地合二为一，大地、丛林和神庙像情人般彼此交缠在一起，再也无法分开。这种自然奇迹并没有毁灭神庙，反而令它获得新的生命，更加坚不可摧。西方一般都认为，吴哥是被法国人穆奥发现的。穆奥最新于自然科学研究，当过中学教师。一八五八年前往湄公河的冒险改变了他的命运。穆奥一行穿过柬埔寨马德旺省的原始丛林，来到了吴哥。当地人把这位西方人领到保佑着他们的神庙面前，他看见的是这样一番景象。这里被原始丛林覆盖，一些神殿倒塌了，另一些岿然不动。祭祀活动在进行，祭祀者不仅有当地人，还包括各种猛兽。穆奥提供了一个伤感的新视角，他在日记里说：“曾经愉悦与荣耀的舞台，成为一片废墟。”
，欧洲人从一九零七年开始介入吴哥遗址的清理保护工作，对吴哥各处遗迹，包括每一块掉下的石块进行编号，为历史找出线索。当时有两种主张，一些人主张清理一切覆盖物，修复重建倒塌的吴哥；另一些人希望只是稍事修整。保持吴哥的原始状态和神秘感。最后，当局决定以科学的方法清理古迹，某些部分则保留原来的状态。至今，帮助修复吴哥的各国修建队都遵从这个原则。中国的古建专家负责修复通王城东门外的周萨神庙，工程负责人曾经主持西藏布达拉宫的修缮，精通拯救如旧的方法。贫乏的想象力很难再现当年雄壮而宏大的场面。可以肯定的是，高棉人的双手有力而且灵巧。大象们参与了吴哥的建造，运输那些巨大的石头。大象把自己的力量注入吴哥，使高棉人有如神助。在湄公河流域，古代神话认为，大象是智慧神的化身。传说，保护神出去打仗的时候，儿子刚刚出生。多年后，保护神回来，儿子不认识他，挡在家门口，不准父亲进家。保护神砍下了儿子的头，那头颅就滚到森林中去了。保护神知道那是自己的儿子后，命令快去森林找他的头。找不到，就把大象的头安在儿子身上。换了一个脑袋后，他成为了智慧之神。吴哥的国王训练众多的大象作为战象，以壮大自己的力量，显示国威。据说，那时的国王常常登上这个战象台。检阅广场上五千头大象组成的军队早期吴哥的核心在巴肯山，那时，王宫、房舍、田园环绕着巴肯山次第展开，它其实就是吴哥全部遗迹的起源之地与中心。每天，吴哥的太阳最先照亮巴肯山，最后从这里落下。如今，在巴肯山顶眺望落日，已经成为吴哥经典的旅游项目。每当落日西垂，这里就聚集着来自世界各地的旅游者，他们被某种穿越时间的力量集合起来，等待着那最后的一刻。大地被吴哥之光照亮，巨大的落日划过天空，沉向黑暗将至的湄公河平原。在每晚最后的光亮中，当地的柬埔寨人喜欢聚集在吴哥窟外的护城河边，守在他们自己的神殿旁。柬埔寨人和他们的吴哥一起，享受晚风的清凉与喧嚣散尽后的宁静。夜幕降临，凝视着这片有生命的石头。七百年前，周达观在《真腊风土记》里描写的吴哥国王出行时的情景，似乎
会在眼前展开。那是一个天国的场面。王出时，诸军马拥其前，旗帜鼓乐踵其后，宫女三五百，花布花及。手持巨竹，自成一队，虽白日一点烛。又有羊车、鹿车、马车，皆以金为饰。其诸陈辽国器，皆齐相在前。远望红梁伞，不计其数。又其次，则国主之妻及妾应，或轿或车，或马或象。其削金两散，何止百余？其后则是国主，立于项上，手持金剑，项之牙亦以金套之。其四围簇拥之象甚多，又有军马护之。每年一月，洞里萨湖的水退回湄公河，又一个捕捞季开始了。洞里萨湖渔民的家是流动的，他们随着湖水的涨落，过着迁徙的生活。旱季来临，湖水退去，鱼群出现了，渔民的家开始向湖心移动，去收获他们的希望。每年六到十月，雨季来临，水不断涨，他们又要向岸边迁移，直至到岸上安家。一年中至少要迁移五到六次。洞里萨湖的渔民是世界上最勤于搬迁的人，迁移的地点是根据水位的深浅决定的。渔民呢，一般选择距离湖岸一两公里远、水深一到两米的水域安营扎寨。上千户渔家彼此连接在一起，形成巨大的水上村寨，继续着祖先们打鱼为生的生活。雨季，洞里萨湖西纳湄公河洪水，面积扩展到一万平方公里；旱季，他又把水还给湄公河，湖面缩小到两千七百平方公里。他调节平衡着湄公河的水量。也调节着东南亚的气候。洞里萨湖是澜沧江湄公河流域最大的湖泊和天然渔场，是镶嵌在柬埔寨大地上的一块活着的黄金。著名的吴哥遗迹群坐落在洞里萨湖的北岸，千年来，它取之不竭的渔业资源，抚育了伟大的高棉文明。渔民们总是在黎明前就出湖捕鱼，早上五点左右是捕鱼的最佳时机。他们通常在距渔村两三公里远的水面展开捕捞活动。茫茫大湖，选择在什么地点下网非常重要，这既需要有捕捞经验，也要靠运气。澜沧江湄公河上的渔民，用多种多样的方式捕捞多种多样的鱼。这条大河孕育了世界上最丰富的淡水鱼类生态系统，鱼类多达一千七百多种，鱼类多样性在世界大江河水系中名列第二，仅次于亚马逊河流域。
，世界野生动物基金会把澜沧江湄公河流域确定为世界上最重要的淡水鱼类生态区之一。澜沧江湄公河流域的鱼类资源，对整个流域内生活的六千五百万人的生计至关重要，是他们获取蛋白质和营养的主要来源。据统计，次区域淡水鱼类的年捕获量在一百八十万吨以上。是世界上最大的内河淡水渔业。一千年来，人们打鱼的工具变化着，曾经是叉子、木船，现在使用机动船和更大的网。人们对鱼类的需求比古代更大，而动力萨湖依然是过去的那个动力萨湖，鱼类也没有因为捕捞工具的先进更多起来。他们认为打鱼生活很快乐，应该永远这样快乐下去，一代又一代人。来<笑>来<笑>来！来<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>虽然应该进入雨季了，但今年洞里萨湖却没有下雨，很少遇上这样的气候。北风一直刮，水位一夜之间骤降，整个渔村被搁置在泥泞的湖床上。大雨终于来临，渔船终于可以开动了。湖上没有水，就什么也没有；只要有了水，就有希望。六月后，澜沧江湄公河流域的雨季正式到来了。原本平静的湖面上开始出现风浪。不管过去几个月捕鱼的黄金时光，他们所获多少，无论如何都得离开了。湄公河的水将滚滚涌入，洞里萨湖将成为一片汪洋大海。
渔村开始要向更安全的岸边迁移，而且在未来五六个月的时间里，渔村要根据涨水和风浪的情况，不断的向更安全的岸边迁移。最终，他们还得搬迁到岸上的高地，躲避风浪。直到来年一月捕捞季开始的时候，他们再重新回到湖里。在雨季无法打鱼的时候，就划着小船卖些小商品，有时在船边捕捞小鱼小虾。虽然今年的捕捞季中，家里没有太多的生活物资储备，但一家人还是乐观的相处在一起。他们同舟共济，要为下一个捕捞季做好准备。洞里萨湖的风浪越来越大，继续待在船上非常危险。随时有翻船的可能，渔民们必须离开洞里萨湖，搬到岸边的高地去了。又一个捕捞季开始了。他们相信，保佑过他们祖先的那些神灵，也会继续保佑他们。